Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Now, I've been requested to make this video quite a lot, so I've decided to finally go ahead and do so. Now, as we all know, bisensory or bimodal neuromodulation is one of the most promising tinnitus research directions we've actually seen in years. Um, but I want to be clear up front, it's definitely not a universal fit. It's not for everybody. And for some people, especially those with severe sound sensitivity, like severe loudness hyperacusis or severe noxacusis, for instance, especially, um, it can actually be the wrong tool to use for any treatment whatsoever. Now, for those of you who don't know, bisensory neuromodulation pairs sound with precisely timed somatosensory stimulation, uh, which is often mild stimulation delivered to areas innervated by the trigeminal or cervical nerves, for example. Uh, now, the goal is to use timing-dependent plasticity or spike-timing-dependent plasticity to shift the abnormal activity patterns that contribute to tinnitus, especially somatic tinnitus, where jaw or neck movements can modulate the tinnitus. Now, clinical research has shown that it does show benefit for tinnitus, uh, and my project as well has shown that it can help uh, certain people. So the real question is, why isn't this treatment for everyone? Why won't it work for everyone? Uh, well, first of all, the same pathways we're trying to modulate can actually be too reactive in certain severe individuals, uh, especially, like I mentioned before, severe loudness hyperacusis and pain hyperacusis. Um, for those of you who don't know, pain hyperacusis, which is often called noxacusis, involves physical pain in response to normal everyday sounds, for instance, depending on the level of severity. Um, and, you know, it can be profoundly disabling. Yeah. When somebody already has a very high level of sound evoked reactivity or pain, um, adding any additional auditory drive especially repeated tones, even if they are a few milliseconds in length, and even if they are quiet, can actually be really risky. And this leads me to another practical issue many people don't think about, which is frequency matching. Um, in Tinnitus Labs, uh, I guess, Susan Shore device style project, uh, frequency matching can be a really, really long process. And for some participants, it can actually take hours per session, and in some cases, it can stretch across multiple weeks to get a reliable match. And that means that repeated sound exposure during the most sensitive phase, uh, you know, when we're trying to identify the right frequency, can be very, very harmful. Um, if you're dealing with severe loudness hyperacusis or noxacusis, that extended finding the frequency period may actually provide too much excitatory drive and can actually worsen hyperexcitability and reactivity. And unfortunately, in my project, uh, we saw some people, several people actually, who spiked specifically from this frequency matching process, unfortunately, and they were not able to start the treatment. Now, this might sound like some bad news for some people, and, you know, it really is quite disappointing, but we have not yet seen any very significant improvement um, in noxacusis, especially if it's severe. Uh, I'm not claiming that it's impossible. It's just a statement about what we've observed so far in the data set that we have. When the project first started, some very severe participants unfortunately experienced spikes uh, very early on. Um, they were informed of the risks of using the device, but uh, the outcome still matters, and we definitely take that seriously. Now, to be fair and accurate, the sound stimulation itself is very brief millisecond tone bursts that are matched to the tinnitus. Uh, you can read about this in Susan Shore's paper, and they cycle a few times a second. Um, and for many people, that sound component alone is truly not enough to cause worsening. And we had some successful cases like Karen, uh, who had very severe reactive tinnitus, uh, who improved as well. Now, if we talk about uh, chronic pain or neuralgia, uh, some participants with significant neuralgia or chronic pain-like symptoms don't respond well to stimulation, likely because the somatosensory side can be too much when there's already, you know, heightened trigeminal system drive. And this is actually something that uh, people should keep in mind when attempting to try the device. Now, mechanistically, uh, this caution that we should have is very plausible because from the research, we know 
that the dorsal cochlear nucleus uh, is a key site of auditory and somatosensory integration, and it receives somatosensory inputs via pathways that include the spinal trigeminal nucleus, or SP5. And if somebody who already has a very heightened somatosensory drive from the spinal trigeminal nucleus, even very, very uh, brief or very light stimulation can actually be not very good. So overall, to keep things brief, uh, here is the current position on future participation if you would ever want to consider building it or participating in my project in the future. If you have heightened sensitivity, especially severe loudness, hyperacusis, and noxacusis, we do not recommend participating in the project uh, or building your own device. Um, if you do choose to participate anyway, you should do so at your own risk, and ideally with clinical guidance and a clear plan. Um, now, as for the timing for those who are curious, we currently have a final group that my assistant is working on while we collect and finalize data or make uh, certain adjustments to the device or protocol. Only after that group is completed will I open the project again. I do not know when exactly this group will, uh, will finish um, their treatment or start their treatment, for instance, but it's not gonna be anytime soon. I would say maybe a few months at least. Um, so what you should get from this video is that this type of treatment can be promising, but the more severe your sound sensitivity or pain phenotype is, uh, the more carefully you actually need to weigh your risks. And I personally do not recommend attempting bimodal uh, neuromodulation or bisensory neuromodulation. If you do have a very heightened level of severity, uh, you should attempt to stay in a relatively quiet environment with minimal exposure to allow your nervous system to relax, uh, maybe a little bit of homeostatic plasticity to occur, and uh, for instance, when you are better enough to try the treatment, then you can go ahead and do it.